morning, everybody. Uh, it's pretty awful to be here at this hour, but believe me, it would be so much worse if you weren't here. So therefore, <laughs> I am profoundly grateful that in my misery, I get to share it with people. Uh, thank you very much to Intrigue's Partners for organizing this session. Uh, thank you for this study. It really is, uh, it really is an important piece of work. Uh, it's not designed to be read all at one time. You'd probably get very depressed if you tried to do that. But it's extremely good to go through and then figure out how this is going to be a reference source. I was asked to pick up a little bit on what Claudia said about all of this taking place against a backdrop in which we have to factor in factors that simply we didn't th th think very much about before. So I'm going to take you through a very brief tour of what it means to have the extra uh, food, energy, water dimension in there on a nexus of stresses. Uh, you will have seen in Claudia's slides a triangular shape behind in most of the slides. And this triangle is a way of saying to the world, you know, look, when we had two or three billion population, we could probably have the water to be able to grow all the food that we could grow, if we were capable of growing, and all the energy that we were capable of developing. As we move up to 7 billion, as we move up to 9 billion, the stressors on this become more and more and more acute. And uh, Carl Ganter, who's going to be in the plenary session, has an amazing picture in Outer Mongolia of coal mines and sitting beside a shepherd's hut and a little bit of water trickling through. And that water can either go to clean the coal for China's insatiable energy demands, or it can go to make sure that this farm goes on. So the triangle, there's many, many people living with the absolute stress of the dimensions on this triangle. Uh, it's set here why this is a triangle, why there are relationships between food and energy, between food and water, and between energy and water. And I must say that in the book, this is, this is set out as clearly as I have ever seen it set out. So if you're looking for a good description of the nexus, what it is, don't look for quantitative assessment. It, it just calls on you to say, look at these factors and look at the fact that they are having pressure impacts on each other. And it's really very well set out in that book as to how this actually works. Any guesses? <laughs> I guess I'm probably that one. Okay, good. So biofuels spark <coughs> spark pressures on either side. So does energy construction, etc. etc. This one? No, no, no. It's the one that's this one on the left. left. Next spot on the left. That spot on the left. Okay, there we are. This has been talked about over and over again, even in the last two days. It's one of my favorite slides. This is the de demand for cereals as we move across time. But the fascinating part of that is the purple bar. Because the purple bar is the demand for food and fodder. What this says is that as we get more prosperous, and this was talked about a lot yesterday, as we become more prosperous, it isn't the overall cereal demand for us to eat, it's the fact that we are putting more and more cereals into the forms of protein that we want to eat as more prosperous communities. And so therefore, the world could possibly manage a cereal demand for humans. But when you add in a double and triple uh, cereal demand for, for protein producers, the, the squeeze goes on. The squeeze goes on on the water side, the squeeze goes on on the food side. Uh, the most important factor for you to remember always in water and agriculture is that it takes about a liter of water, twice one ounce, to produce one calorie. If you're producing a calorie of anything, it takes one liter of water. So if you have a cup of wheat, that will take the a number of liters that has to do with the calories of wheat. If that cup's full of gasoline, it takes that many more liters because you've got a higher energy equivalent in there. But this is a very important thing to have in your mind. This is where this is where the big change is is with us. Okay, on the water side, anybody who's ever worked in water knows what the challenges are. Limited ability to pay, limited ability to cap. So this is for all water systems. History of undercharging, capacity deficiencies, politics, corruption. Uh, bureaucracies at all level, waste and wastewater systems that just already are not capable of delivering what it is that we need in too many parts. 
parts of the world. So when I'm going to give the prescriptions, you have to put this against systems that are already in far too many parts of the world limping along for these reasons. And here's the new kid on the block. It used to be that we worried about whether there was enough water to make, to, to reach the food needs of people and food and the municipal use. But the new kid on the block says, look, I, I'm energy. Everybody wants me. We're starting to include energy. Even this report has included the energy demand of people as opposed to, they wouldn't have done that a few years ago. We simply thought if we fed people, that's what we were really all about. Now we're including energy because we realize that is how you get the inject development into overall well-being. Extraction, refinery, hydropower, thermoelectric, cooling, extraction, transmission, drinking water treatment, wastewater treatment, all of those take water. And if it's too early in the morning to buy, buy, wrap your mind around that, there's pictures of it. But those are all of the, th the ways that we produce energy and try and imagine doing one of those things without water. You can't. And the bigger the energy installation, the more that you really need water to do that. So you begin to see why in areas that are short of water for growing food, when you have an energy installation moving in, that you are increasing the pressure. There's the rest of it, energy for water. We have water for energy, we have energy for water. Whoops. Well, we would have. Um, <laughs> it takes water to make energy, it takes energy to make water. So. That's the kind of backdrop to when, uh, when the study stops, talks about the new stressors being energy being added into the, into the equation. So I just want to say, well, can anything be done? I mean, it's tough enough when you're talking about agricultural and food production processes among people that are really without very many factors of production and are really at the bottom of the um, socioeconomic chain. When you add in energy, doesn't the situation simply become hopeless because everybody knows that energy will be given pride of place above agriculture in terms of demands on water, demands on time, demands on legislators' attention, demands on um, um, public acceptability. Can anything really be done? Oil prices, food price volatility, floods and droughts, aren't these too big for us to actually do the kind of concrete things that we're talking about? that Cody is talking about, you know, try and give pride of place, try and remember the needs of women, etc. Well, yes, you can actually do something. Why? First of all, because these things are in good part local. The Nexus operates primarily locally, not uniquely, but primarily locally. So where it's local, there is scope to do something about it. Uh, it's mostly a process question. Uh, who's talking to each other? How are people thinking? And who's been brought together? to find out what the capacity is to do, accomplish two things at once. And to actually do something in the energy area that might not, that might lessen the impact on food production or might, might line these things up in a different sequence. We used to run water from agriculture into the cities. Now we're sort of thinking, no, why don't we turn that around? Agriculture uses 100% of the water you give it through evapotranspiration. If you run it through the cities first, clean it up a little bit, run it into agriculture. But cities only use 70% of the water that runs through them. So starting to think differently about how we line up these, uh, the, the, the uses of good things are happening and we need to know from them. Uh, and I just want to go over very, very few because we've got to listen to our other panelists. But all over the world, uh, countries are sitting and saying, we can line these things up a little bit differently. Companies are doing it more than governments are at the stage. And we really have to recognize that the private sector is understanding that this is the new market, is getting, getting a three for one or getting a two for one. And so uh, you'll see examples like Australia, where you've got a number of big companies moving in and saying, we'll take the wastewater from there, we'll clean it up, We'll, uh, we'll uh, make it so that you can use it in hydroelectric production. And after it comes out of that, we will make sure that it's clean enough to use in agricultural production and maybe be recycled back <coughs> into drinking water. So uh, if, if you start to alleviate some of the shortages, often at the expense of energy and green water and greenhouse gases. Um, Australia is sitting down putting up a policy framework that is trying to get nationally compatible market regulatory planning based system of managing surface and groundwater resources for rural and urban that uses water access entitlements. That's a big mouthful. And that would be a wonderful thing for countries to 
uh, strive toward, but it is a very difficult area to try and get to. We can smarten up water use. Um, smart meters, you know what smart meters are? Smart meters is when you give your meter a cell phone, uh, or an, I guess it's an iPhone. It's basically a meter that has a radio transmitter within it, and uh, there, it gives real-time data on demand. It gives flood indicators, groundwater quality, but you can also then start to regulate your energy use for getting that water there, as well as your water use, because you've got you've got constant uh, constant playback on how much water you're using, and therefore how much en your energy you're using to get the water. So you can start regulating and start working with that to get more out of both. Malta is now totally smart metered. Okay, Malta's small, uh, but and they're pretty dry. But uh, th this shows that it is possible to start doing the water management in such a way that it conserves the energy and conserves the water. We can smarten up spending, move from a traditional single objective spending, uh, invest in runoff reduction and storm water management strategies so that we get those kinds of water back again. We can figure out that there's no wastewater. We can demand that all wastewater treatment plants produce enough energy to run themselves and, if possible, enough energy to run other sources. Rotterdam runs 400 buses a day on the, on the energy that comes from their sewage waste. Uh, so therefore, we can start looking at things, and instead of thinking of wastewater as something that you take away as far as possible and get rid of, start thinking of it as something that contains heat, it contains nutrients, it contains other items that can be used to start alleviating that triangle of shortages. Final one, got to look at some things really carefully. Here's a, I'll give you a three in one, and it's called deep placement of fertilizer. I bet you thought I wasn't going to say there's there's a dramatic thing for you, but it really is. One of the major sources of despoilation of water, of eutrophication, is the runoff of too much fertilizer being used. Broadcasting fertilizer is something fertilizers do as soon as farmers do as soon as they can. If you put that fertilizer in a pellet at the base of the plant, you can reduce your fertilizer use. That's the energy side of that. You can reduce the fertilizer use by up to 40%. You can therefore decrease the farmer's cost, so therefore we're into the growth part, and you can increase the yield by up to 30 to 40%. If the government is foolish enough to be subsidizing uh, fertilizers against the advice of <laughs> the good folk from IFPRI, it greatly reduces the subsidy bills that the, that the government is going to have to pay. So, less runoff, less despoilation of water, less eutrophication, more growth, more food. You get a three for one on all the sides of the triangle. It's sustainable, it increases, it increases reliance, and it increases, um, what's that word that stands that it says that you'll stand up to anything? Resilience. That's what it reduces to. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.